Hello and welcome to the first Clubhouse podcast here at Volcano Stadium. Uh, I'm Zach Priest. I'm here with uh, Lucas Anderson and Matt McDonald, pitcher for the Volcanoes. Lucas, uh, what's going on, man? Nothing much. Just watched some practice for the Volcanoes, watched a couple bullpens. Excited to get going on our first podcast episode here in this 2022 season. Yeah, man. And uh, we're joined with, like I said, Matt McDonald, Volcanoes pitcher, uh, just through a bullpen. Matt, how you how you feeling today? Oh, feeling good. Ready to get after this weekend and, you know, hit about the halfway point of the season. So this is when things really start to heat up, get interesting. So I'm looking forward to the second half, making a push. Yeah, it's definitely getting into the dog days here in uh, the Mavericks League. Uh, so let's take a look at what went on this last weekend. So there was two series. Uh, they played two separate three-game series. The first one was uh, Mavericks and Senators, which kind of was a wild one, honestly. Uh, Mavericks have stormed out of nowhere to take first place. They swept the Senators uh, in the three scores for those games. First one was 11-8, to eight, second one was 11-5, to five, and the last one was 6-2. to two. So that took place this last weekend, and that sweep, uh, like I mentioned, propels them into first place over the Volcanoes. Um, the Volcanoes had actually played the Campesinos uh, in the other series, and they were looking for the sweep heading into Sunday, but uh, Matt McDonald started out there on Sunday, and you got kind of banged up a little bit, Matt. Was there something that felt weird, or, or what was going on? No, that's just baseball. It's going to happen eventually. I mean, I just went out there and made my pitches. You know, I've pitched against Campesinos a couple times, so they came out there with a good approach. They were spitting on the slider pretty much the entire time, and, you know, that's just how baseball goes, so now i got to make my adjustments and roll from there. Yeah, in uh, that first game on, I believe you guys played on Thursday, uh, it was 17-4. to <laughs> You guys won. Jose Villa hit a grand slam. That oh, was yeah. pretty wild. Um, so that was kind of an ox- offensive explosion from you guys. The second game on Saturday, you guys won 5-4, to kind of a nail-biter, uh, Jacob Aspidia came in and closed the door for four outs. What's his uh, – does he come in from the pen for multiple innings like that? I can't really remember. Yeah, he does. He kind of a does, kind of a do-it-all guy. Sometimes he'll be first up. Sometimes he's in the late relief role. I mean, he's open to anything. He's open to starting if we need him to. Hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure it will at some point. I mean, he really just wants to take the ball. It doesn't really matter the situation. The job stays the same. He's got to get outs, whether it's the first or the ninth inning. Yeah, yeah his uh... – that relief appearance was kind of crazy because he ended up with a runner at second and worked out of it. That was the tying run out there at second. Right. Yeah, he came in actually in the eighth with two outs. It was outs. a four-out save. Yeah, yes. it was a four-out save. Um, yeah, Campesinos, that was Josh Rigo with that two-run shot opposite field to bring it within one run. He, he was the pinch hit yeah, homer. Yeah, yeah. That was a crazy game. So you guys squeaked that one out five to four. And then, like I said, you came out on Sunday, kind of got touched up for four runs early, got pulled out, and uh, you guys ended up losing nine to one. So couldn't complete the sweep. And that was kind of uh, a weird – this weekend was kind of funky because it uh, so much rode on the standings. Um, and now we've got the Mavericks in first, which is kind of wild. So we'll go ahead and take a look at – those standings real quick so right now in first it's the mavericks at 15 and 11 volcanoes at 13 and 11 just behind them in second place senators 12 and 13 in third place and then the campesinos at 9 and 14 in last place uh it's really tight honestly between all you guys even uh campesinos don't even look like they're out of it either four and a half games is not that bad um at this point in the season um so yeah, Chase Jesse, someone we wanted to talk about. Uh, do you have any stats on him from that from that outing, Lucas? It I was mean, kind of wild. His fastball is like possibly the best in the league. I would say top yeah. three in the league. Uh, second highest average fastball velocity in the league at eighty nine miles an hour, and he's we've seen him peak at ninety two. So, yeah. um, and then he's really good at maintaining that velo throughout the starts. I mean, even later in the in the innings, he's still at about eighty seven and eighty six. Yeah. Um, he's kind of a strikeout guy. <laughs> a true strikeout guy where he either strikes you out or it seems like a walk every time um, are really the two outcomes. Yeah. We'll pull up the stats here. Yeah, things just aren't getting hit off of him. Like you're saying, it's uh, what we'll see is like a strikeout, and then he'll, he, he can walk a few guys right. here and there. But he ends up working out of it a lot. We saw yeah. – but it, it can come back to bite him because his stat line from that game this weekend, he started uh, 14 strikeouts, only allowed two hits – and was pegged with the loss yep. when he left the game, which is just a crazy. He went through six and two-thirds. Like, 
Yeah, it's rough. So that, I mean, hey, those walks will come back to bite you. And, you know? and we've seen him put it together for some really good starts. I mean, he, what, that one game he had a no-hitter through seven? Yeah. And so, I mean, he's gone deep into the games lately, and when he puts it all together, he's a really scary pitcher for the yeah. Senators. Yeah. Uh, Matt, have you had a chance to see – uh, Chase Jesse played all this season or I've seen him a little bit I mean it's pretty clear that his stuff plays at this level if he's filling up the zone he's going to have a lot of success yeah definitely one of our favorite pitchers to watch uh, it feels kind of like like big league stuff almost oh, like yeah. it, it's got flashes of that with the way he he throws the ball um all right so we've got Matt here uh your stats this year have been kind of insane if we're being honest uh you made the transition last year. You were out of the bullpen um, for the whole year, right? I made three starts at the very end of the season, but besides that, the first, I mean, 40 games, I was strictly out of the bullpen with all types of rolls out of the pen, but always a relief guy until the very end of the year. Yeah, so you've been starting. So Okay, you've made 10 appearances this year. Eight of them have been starts, and basically those two bullpen appearances that you've come out have really just been like one-inning uh, tosses, just kind of keeping the arm loose. Uh, did you talk to Tony Torcado before the season about being a starter? Or was that just kind of like a... No, it sort of just came up as the season began. I definitely... Well, going into the season, I figured I'd be out of the pen similar to last year. Where it was just like a bunch of appearances come in pretty much every game here and there for an inning to three innings, somewhere in that range. But I mean, start the season, we just needed a couple of starters. Told Tony, hey, if you need a starter, I'm in. And then first weekend went out there and then just kind of rolled from there. Yeah, and it's been a pretty wild ride. Um, you're five and one on the year in those ten appearances, forty-seven innings thrown on the dot. You are head and shoulders above everybody on your team. The only person, in terms of innings wise, the only person close behind you in second place is Jared Bell at thirty-two innings. So you've got fifteen more innings uh, than the person in second. Uh, you've only allowed is that sixteen runs in forty-seven innings. ERA's gone above three. You're at a three point oh six now. Um, but yeah, you've struck out 42 in those 47. I mean, the stats are kind of jumping off the page. You can just tell that the numbers as you go across the line are just bigger than everybody else's numbers. Um, yeah, it's crazy to see. Do you feel comfortable starting now, or what, how's that going? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had so many starts in my life before this. I mean, all through high school, I was a starter, and before that and everything. So, I mean, starting isn't unfamiliar territory for me. It's just something that, uh, again, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the, my job is to get out, so it doesn't matter if it's the first inning or the ninth inning. Either way, like I got to make my pitches. I have to execute pitches at a high rate, and if I do that, the numbers will happen. I try really not to think about them when I'm out there. And what's the routine change from being a reliever to a starter? Reliever, you're kind of getting hot in the bullpen. Starter, you have a lot more time to get ready. How does that affect you? Um, I sort of try to take – I'm probably the – I probably take the least amount of time of anyone in the league to warm up before a start. <laughs> um, I try to treat it almost like a relief appearance because, I mean, that's what I did all through college. So for the past, I mean, six years – that's what I've been doing. So, I mean, just go out there kind of later than most people do, play a little bit of catch, hop in the pen, don't need too many pitches, but just trying to make sure I feel comfortable and my pitches are spinning off my fingers right. And if I can do that, we're good to go. Yeah, no, it's so funny. Some of the times I've gone down there to get stuff for, like, social media and we're, like, 20 minutes before game time and you're just, like, <laughs> walking over to the bullpen to get loose. It's so funny to watch because we see so many pitchers across the league have, like, whole day routines like, right i've seen Noah what i'll get here like two three hours before a game uh before the one o'clock game just starting to get right. get ready but yeah, it's definitely fun to watch um yeah i guess we'll, we'll jump into this q a now yeah um, i guess the first question we kind of had was uh who the toughest hitters been uh through so far in the league against you um and how are you dealing with that in terms of trying to get that person out um, it's funny because obviously last year the answer would be Matt Holiday, but luckily we got him on my side now. I don't have to throw to him. That helps my numbers, if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah. But um, if I were to pick some, there's a couple that pop out. Emerson's a tough out on the Mavericks. Yeah. Um, lefty, he's got a good approach. He slaps balls all over the field. Um, and then Edgar and Anhedi both. I mean, they, they're really good at laying off the off-speed pitches. They're going up there looking for a pitch that they can drive and handle. And they're both really good at that. So I would have to say those three guys are all qual they're all tough A Bs every single time. They grind them out. Yeah, for sure. And that's three guys that across the league, uh 
they're playing really well this year. I mean, Emerson's opening day was four for four with four singles and a couple RBIs. He's a so, good player. Yeah, dude. Um, yeah, you, you got any more questions for me? Um, yeah, so who is your not on your team? Who's your favorite pitcher that you've gotten a chance to watch in this Mavericks league? I like watching Noah Woodall on the camps. Oh, yeah. I think he's got good stuff, and I like how, I mean, he mixes timings really well, both in terms of pitch selection, in terms of delivery. He'll come out and go a little quick pitch. He hesitate a little bit. He'll give you a good slider. Like, I like how he mixes his stuff, and he's fun to watch throw. Yeah. For sure. That's uh we've joked about the pace of play. <laughs> yeah. Whenever we see it's Woodall against you, um, we get excited. Yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he, he works with a good pace. That's yeah. also another reason. Yeah. Um uh, so we've noticed, because, uh, I mean, we've been around, me and Luke has been around all four clubhouses at this point, definitely different vibes oh, yeah. between all four uh, in their own way, yeah. not that any of them are bad, but whenever we end up in the Volcanoes clubhouse, it's a riot. Like, you guys are always having a good time. Is there, I mean, is it, be, is it because you guys are winning, or is it because you guys have a lot of returning players from last year? Like, what's the background, I guess, behind the no, team I chemistry? Think we just got a good group. I mean, we all have our, like, guys that we talk to and we all mesh well together at the same time so like obviously on any team you're on the pitchers are all going to hang out infielders generally hang out stuff like that but outside of that we all mesh really well together you know after games going to grab food and stuff and i mean we just get along really well and i think that helps there's always music going someone's got to bring a speaker of course and that's taken care of it's going to be a good time in the clubhouse yeah so who's uh who's the funniest guy on the team so Jake Lealios is one of the funniest people I've ever met, and also Jose Villa. I wish I could talk to him more because he's primarily to speak Spanish, but he is just unbelievably funny, even though I don't understand most of what he says yeah. because I don't speak much Spanish. But one of those two guys, they're funny people. Yeah. We kind of thought Lealios would be the yeah, answer, but I wanted to hear it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you guys got uh, – we, we know that Jake Lealios loves Applebee's. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah <laughs> you guys got a group of young fans chanting Applebee's uh, a couple weeks ago, and the crowd was pretty hilarious that to hear. Awesome. <laughs> um, but, no, I've noticed that with your guys' team because I've been out a couple of times with you guys after games, and just the amount of people from the team that actually go is pretty crazy. I mean, the last last week when we went out, there was like, I had to be like 12, 15 guys yeah, there. Yeah, I think there was almost 15 yeah. guys there. We go in, and he's like, how many yeah. are coming? I'm like, eight, ten, yeah. maybe more. I'm like, <laughs> And then people show up, and I mean, and that definitely helps the clubhouse because, I mean, we get in the next day. We're talking about, you know, from dinner the night before, it all just went into the next day. I mean, it's a, it's a good time, especially a lot of the guys here traveling. They don't live here, so, I mean, it's really just like you spend more time around those people right now than you do sometimes around, like, right, right now, a lot of their families that they see. And so, I mean, in a way, like, that's just – you build a good relationship with those guys just because the amount of time you spend with them. Oh yeah, it's a it's a long summer, a lot of games in a very short amount of time. Um, but one of my favorite things about the Mavericks League so far that I've seen um, is the trades, the pickups, the releases. People kind of floating around from team to team. I mean, I wasn't here last year, but like you mentioned, I know Matt Holiday was on the Mavericks, I believe, and then yep. now he's with you guys. So just things have gone down. Uh, with that being said, is there a teammate that you that's either not in the league anymore, has moved on, or is on another team? Uh, who's the teammate that you miss the most from last year's Volcanoes team? So I got a couple I got to uh, recognize here. Landon Barnes was the guy. I absolutely love that guy. He's uh, doing really well in the Frontier League right now, so he's moved up. That's awesome. Um, Gabriel Cotto behind the dish, great guy to throw to. He's Puerto Rican. And, I mean, he was just filthy behind the dish. He had a good arm, good receiving. Um, and then my buddy Evan Brissentine, left-handed pitcher. I mean, he dominated last year until he ended up, like, tearing his MCL on his knee pitching and then threw on it in championship game. He's an absolute sure. warrior. But, yeah, I mean, I miss those guys all a lot. It's hard to pick one out of the three. Yeah, Barnes had Barnes had maybe the best walk-up song. He had Party on 5th Ave by yeah. Matt Miller. We that was always a good one. just talking about that, yeah. yeah. Um, so you have a pretty interesting pitch repertoire. You're kind of a, a sinker, change-up slider guy. How did you come up with this pitch repertoire, and at, at what stage or what level did you add these pitches? Um, so my the sinker two seam, I mean, I've always been a low three-quarter guy. And, I mean, like, well, like in high school, I pretty much just threw two seams for the mm-hmm. most part. But it got a lot better as my arm slot dropped freshman year of college. The change-up's always kind of been there. That one I've constantly been working on because sometimes it'll – 
it'll get lost for like months and then come back to me. Um, the slider's been the one that developed the most late. Like throughout mm -hmm. college, my slider was trash. It was yeah. just not a good pitch. Um, and then it was really just like after I finished college and I was just messing around throwing bullpens in the facilities, like I kind of found a grip or like a seam orientation that actually got what I wanted. And then I got on the wrap soto to actually measure it to make sure, all right, am I crazy or is this actually doing what I think it's doing? And it was. So, I mean, ever since then, it's been trying to get comfortable mm -hmm. kind of ripping off of that seam and creating the movement that I want with it. Yeah. It's a, uh, and we talked about that arm slot cause you're now, I mean, I guess it's considered like full sidearm. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we played in high school together. Your arm slot didn't always used to be like that. I know that you said you, you dropped it down in college and we, we were wondering because at that point, technically, uh, I mean, I don't know how much you thought you were going to play after college. So I would say that that kind of was getting later into your baseball career to my question is that how like confident were you uh, when you were asked to drop your arm slot? Because that's a big change for someone who's been throwing the same way for, like his whole life, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, it took probably two full years in college to really get like consistent with it just because I would try to drop down and I would drop down, but it wasn't the same slot every time. Sometimes it would be closer to sub. Sometimes it would be kind of sidearm. Sometimes I'd pull off and it would come back up kind of like, like low three quarters. So just trying to find something that was a, uh, consistent took a lot of tinkering and just a lot of reps to really get dialed mm -hmm. uh that story is actually kind of funny of why i dropped down uh freshman year of college after fall ball i did really well freshman year of fall ball i think i give like one run throughout fall and so i come into the meeting i'm feeling good about it in post fall meeting and our coach was basically sat me down and he's like you know i'm touching like 81 82 from like low three quarters and he's basically like all right so like philosophy is not gonna play um here's what we're gonna do you either got to get up to like the 85 range uh, you can drop down like Cody. Cody was a senior sidearm guy. He was a closer at that point. He goes, or you can throw a knuckleball. And then started explaining to me <laughs> what a knuckleball was. And that was, uh, walked out of that meeting with uh, very little confidence. <laughs> but you know, it got to work. I figured the sidearm would be the best option of the three yeah. <laughs> and went to work on that and tried to figure it out. It took me a couple of years to really get comfortable with it, but it ended up working out all right. Yeah, well, that's... Uh it's kind of crazy because were you getting a lot of appearances like your freshman, sophomore year as a sidearm reliever? Because, I mean, they didn't end up cutting you or anything, right? So you had to have been doing something right for them to keep you around on the team. Right. So, like, Linfield actually has a JV college program where we would play JUCOs in the air. So we would play Chemeketa, Clark, all the NWAC schools, basically. And so the first two years, I was, like, I would come up and, like, suit up for the varsity, like, the college games and, and conference and stuff. But, like, I never really got in the game. It was just I would get the innings against, like, Chemek and Clark and all those guys and, like, you know, it was really, like, first year I struggled for sure, and then the second year there, like, it was obvious improvement in that realm um, in terms of how my stuff was playing and commanding the two-seamer where I wanted to consistently, and then it was, like, junior year that I started taking on the role of, like, being a more regular relief guy, and then senior year ended up uh, relieving, I think I had, like, 21 appearances in however many games, which was, like, the most that the schools had in the past, like, 20-something years, <laughs> so, I mean... Uh, after that, it was fine, but it did take a couple years before I got into a consistent relief role. Yeah. So was there a pitcher, like, growing up that you kind of modeled your game after, and then when you went to the more sidearm arm slot, was there anybody that you studied that found success with that? Yeah, so when I was, like, more over-the-top guy, Sonny Gray throughout oh, high school yeah. was always my guy. I absolutely loved watching him pitch on the A's. Um, but so after that, once I sort of dropped down, I've watched a lot of video of like Sergio Romo. Mm. I mean, he's a guy that, I mean, in terms of pitch mix and what he throws, I've watched a ton of. And I mean, I just love how relentless he is with that slider. Like uh -huh. he does not care if the guy knows it's coming. Yeah. It's just, I'm going to attack with my best pitch right now. And it's a slider. And so here it is. Let's see what you do with it. And he just has been doing that for the last like 14, 15 years right. in the yeah. big leagues. So, I mean, it's not like he's blowing anybody away with velocity. He just got nasty stuff and he's confident with it. And so that's something that I try to model after a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting one because he's, I'm looking at it now. He's got the same pitch mix, slider, sinker, yep. changeup, with a very similar arm slot. So that's a, that's definitely a good one to model. Former after Salem bit. Kaiser Volcano. Sergio yeah, Rome. was he really? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, uh, I love that twenty. Was that the twenty? Uh, that the twelve World Series? Yeah, yeah where he struck out Miggy on a fastball, yeah. middle, middle. 
That yeah. was awesome. It's like, yeah, because he's thrown seven sliders in a row. Exactly. And he just throws a fastball out of nowhere in the biggest pitch of the year. Yeah, and it just froze him. Yeah, what is he yeah. going to do? He's like, he's sitting slider. Yeah. He knows the slider's coming. Yeah. Oh, it starts outside, runs his way back. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of like what we can see from you because we've seen it so many times because we'll track Yacker Tech during everybody's mm-hmm. outings. We'll see you go to that slider three, four, five times in a row, especially to somebody like, let's say, on Hetty. You'll just hammer down on sliders and uh i'm not letting him find a barrel yeah if he exactly. does it's getting hit really hard <laughs> yeah but that's where you can see the similarities of like you put so much fear in somebody with that slider that you can freeze them then with that two seam running in or that change up loan away um yeah i do that comparison is uh i like it a lot to sergio romo um so i guess it any level because at this point you've played kind of everything i mean when did you start playing baseball i don't know yeah. yeah. T-ball, whenever you start, whenever, yeah, yeah, whenever yeah. you start T-ball. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and uh, here we are at your 25 now. Um, what was your single game best performance that you've ever had in your life? Any There's level. Yeah. Two that come to mind. One was in the Mavs League last year and one was mm-hmm. in college. I had a college outing against Cal Lutheran where I came in and went five and two thirds of perfect relief. Got 17 guys in a row to end the game. We got the win. And then last year in the Mavs League, there was a game against the Mavericks where it was like 117 degrees. And I came out and I threw six no-hit innings. And the only two guys that got on base were intentional walks and extra innings. So, I mean, those are the two that come to mind of best performances that I've had um, and just days where everything goes right. Sort of like the 10-10-80 rule. Like 10, 10% of the time, you're going to feel terrible. 10% of the time, you're going to feel amazing. And 80% of the time is where you're going to live most of the time. And that's where you got to make your adjustments, make your pitches, and just compete out there, try to get your outs. Um, yeah, it's funny that – I, I mean, I've seen you pitch in extreme weather a few times. I know you've kind of talked about that. It seems like where you thrive, you know, yeah. cold, hot, all those extreme ones. So – I like asking this question. If you had a time machine and you could go back and watch any moment in baseball history from the beginning of t- from the beginning of the game in person, what would you pick? What moment would this you pick? This one's this one's tough. I, the big one that comes to mind would be Bumgarner coming out of the pen Ooh. in 2014 against the Royals in Game Seven. Okay, that was that whole series of what he was done leading up to that it would have been really cool to be in the park and just see everyone just go silent as he comes walking <laughs> in knowing like we're done like there's no, <laughs> there's no chance like that level of dominance and that and that level of play at the biggest stage there is was insane to watch yeah, that's that's a pretty good one. Yeah, um, I can't even think. I mean, you asked that question. I was trying to think myself. There's just so many to to put like one right choice down. The other, yeah. one, the other one that comes to mind would be Tim Lincecum K and fourteen Braves in the NLDS in 2010, I believe. Ooh. Shout out Tim Lincecum, go dogs. <laughs> um with that being said then as now we've talked about you know kind of moving on to major league stuff uh who's your favorite pitcher to watch like right now in the bigs because yeah, i know you watch a lot of baseball um there's a few obvious ones like Degrom, obviously just because his stuff is not human um yeah. max scherzer the intensity level i know every pitcher says that one but i mean the intensity he gets when he gets around sixth, seventh inning, he starts stalking around the mound. It's like, <laughs> okay, nobody's touching anything yep. this man's going to throw. Uh, one recent one I've really liked watching is uh, Spencer Strider, uh, rookie on the Braves. Disgusting. I mean, he's like 99 to 102. His legs are bulging out of his pants. He's got a filthy <laughs> mustache, and he's just shoving it by guys. So, I mean, he's really fun to watch as well, which is funny because none of those guys are like similar to me at all in terms <laughs> yeah. of pitch arsenal or repertoire, yeah. but they're just – fun to watch they execute their pitches well they know what they're good at and they live on it so yeah uh why do you think i mean like you just said he's pitching 99 to 101 uh we've seen such a high climb in velocity at almost every level of baseball uh going down through little league and stuff what do you think's changing because it never used to be like that i mean you look at babe ruth the fastballs he was facing it's like 88 86 you know so what i don't know is there anything you can maybe put your finger on that might be why we're changing in a direction of higher velocity and crazier pitches yeah i think it's just that there's more understanding of what contributes to velocity i mean like if i were to put up an example it's like technology cell phone cell phones weren't a thing you think about the first iphone and now in the last however many years not that long and how much more advanced that's gotten it's the same way with everything i think it's the same way with baseball and pitching the understanding of 
like for example they used to think that baseball players shouldn't lift weights like that was a thing i'll grow like they shouldn't get bulky you shouldn't be lifting and then steroid era and then everyone was bulging out of their jerseys hitting tanks throwing gas and i mean people started to realize okay this does play what else plays like weighted balls it used to be a big like don't throw weighted balls you're going to get your arm hurt but at the same time a football's weighted it's much heavier than a baseball you don't see quarterbacks going down with tommy john and so like All of that kind of stuff starts to play in, more research gets done on it, and there's just a lot more information and programs to help aid in that velocity, and they're getting a lot more widespread amongst the country, and I think that has contributed to high school velocities increasing, college velocities. I mean, you've seen college guys now throwing 105. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's just the way the game is trending in terms of uh, velocity is going to continue to go up, and I don't think we're going to see many guys that are – throwing harder than the top guys right now like DeGrom or uh, Ben Joyce or whoever it is but I think we're going to see more guys creeping up into that 95 to 100 range in the big leagues in 15 20 years it's damn gonna be dang near everybody yeah yeah that's I keep talking about that like that's something it's, it used to be such a revelation if somebody threw like upper 90 to 100 and now it seems like every MLB team has a guy who throws 100 it's kind of like just the way the game is going at this point and it's pretty cool to watch the evolution almost of pitchers yeah I mean even uh right now I mean we're independent ball here at the Mavericks League and we're seeing guys get stretched out as our season goes on we're consistently seeing 90 to 92 yeah. I would say from pitchers that at the beginning of the season we didn't even realize had that velocity right. and now as we're getting into the middle part of the season guys are kind of getting stretched out and really just letting it fly it's fun to watch I mean uh I love seeing a dude just gas somebody up at, oh, like, yeah. 100, and then I love seeing a 500-foot home run. I mean, that's the beauty in baseball, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess we were wondering um, who your biggest influence, like, in your actual life was, uh, not necessarily, like, um, a player or anybody like that, but just someone in your life who influenced you the most growing up playing baseball. Oh, just in uh, in terms of baseball and just in terms of everything, just my parents. I grew up in a really – I'm lucky with the household I grew up in. Mm-hmm. I had great parents, very supportive parents. And in terms of baseball, I mean, my mom was a catcher, softball catcher in high school. She was like all East Bay. And so she was a stud <laughs> catcher, so she knew the sport. And my dad is always – he was a pitcher in high school, and he is always like – in terms of baseball-wise, stressed on me the importance of like – since I was a kid, like, throw strikes, getting ahead. Like, he used to give me, like, rewards. Like, he would, like, if I went an inning or two without walking guys in an appearance, he would, like, take me to the snack shack. He had it for, like, my whole team. Like, if you had, like, if you didn't walk anyone out there, you were going to the snack shack and the, the snacks were on uh, snacks were on Jerry. So, I mean, in terms of baseball-wise, especially them, and then just in terms of everything, in terms, like, just what person I've shaped up to be, it's entirely my parents. Nice. And um, talking about influence, your, your coach – Tony Torcado played in the MLB. What insight has he given you guys as a former MLB guy? Because I'm sure he has a lot of knowledge to hand down to you guys. Is there anything in particular or, you know, any lessons that he's taught you guys that has really paid off from his experience in the MLB? Yeah, just in terms of how he handles situations, mm-hmm. number one. And in two, just just getting feedback from him. Just, like, after the last outing against Camp Cena, to go up to Tony, like, hey, like, what, what did you see? Like, what did you notice? Because I value that input. You're talking to a former big leaguer. Um, and, you know, he sees the game through a lens that not a lot of us have gotten the opportunity or will ever get the opportunity to see it through. So, I mean, he's played with people like Barry Bonds and just absolute legends. So, I mean, yeah, I'm always just kind of talking to him, asking him what he's seeing out there and just trying to kind of pick his brain a little bit in that aspect. Yeah, it's been fun to watch Tony manage. It's been fun to watch everybody manage here at the Mavericks League. Um, But I guess – there's sometimes we'll see questionable moves uh, from Tony at some point. I mean, we've seen from all the um, yeah the managers, and we'll talk about it on the broadcast too, where, where we're like, you know, that's why we're in the box and they're down <laughs> on the field managing. Uh, but it's interesting because, like you're saying, they do see the game through a different lens, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, something's going on, they're gonna figure it out. Um, so I guess we'll move on to where you guys are in the standings, how it started. So for those who didn't watch any games to start the season, the Volcanoes were on an absolute tear the first month, month and a half. Um, and then you guys kind of hit a skid where you went like – you in seven games you had went like one in six. You got almost back-to-back sweeps uh, put up on you guys. And now you've kind of figured it back out. I know guys were injured. Derrick Bell kind of came back after missing a few starts. Uh, Jose Villa is getting healthier with his back and hamstring. Um what do you think that you guys had at the beginning of the season that was so special? What do you think went wrong? And then 
now what are you guys doing to kind of rebound? Yeah, so, I mean, we have a really talented squad, and I think that's very apparent. Like, our offense, we rake. Like, one through nine, I feel confident when guys are up to the plate that we're going to score runs. Now, and just and to just consistency, like, obviously we got hit with a little bit of an injury bug. Like, Jared, last year, he's one of our best starters, and, I mean, two starts in, he had to sit out a couple weeks. So, I mean, just getting consistently guys back and consistent defense, consistent pitching. And if we can do those two things, we're going to score the runs to win baseball games. Um, and it's easy to, like, when we're up by 10, 11 runs, those errors don't make as much of a difference. They're not as noticeable. But in those tight games, everything gets uh, – magnifying glass gets put on those types of issues. So, I mean, it's just – once we figure that out, and I think we are right now, we're definitely doing a lot better in terms of that front. But consistency on defense and consistency on the mound will be the reason that we take off. And I think that that's the direction that we're headed is in that, figuring that out. So, yeah, you've kind of talked about what you guys need to do and – what are what's probably the other toughest team that you guys have to face in this league, and who do you think is kind of that biggest competition out there? I will say the way that this league is going this year, it is so tight yeah. that anything can happen on any day versus any two teams. It's kind of wild. Yeah, but we've seen that too. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, like I know the Mavericks play a lot of small ball. And they're tough because of that. Like, they know themselves really well. They know their approach. They know what they're good at. They're fast. They slap the ball around the field. They run hit and runs. They steal. They do all that kind of stuff. And they know how to do it, and they do it well. So just in terms of that front, they are a tough opponent. But, again, it's so tight that, I mean, I still think it's anybody's. It could be anybody's game at this point going forward. 100%. Um, Yeah, so I guess we're talking about goals. So... I mean, I would say we're pretty much at the halfway point. We're pretty close. Yeah. I think this next weekend's pretty close to the halfway point. Um, what are, you know, some goals maybe you had coming into the season that have either stayed the same or you've kind of readjusted now that the season started for yourself personally? And, uh, you know, what do you want the team to achieve uh, in alignment, I guess, with those goals? For the team, I want to win it. I mean, yeah. it's very simple. I want to end the season on top in championship game, win the league. I mean, we came close last year. Uh, came into the championship game, ended up losing to the Campesinos, who are a very talented squad. Um, but in terms of personal goals, I don't really have too many. I try to really, like, the numbers are what they are, but if I can stick with the process and try to execute my pitches as a, at a high rate consistently, outing to outing, the results will come. But a little one I got is if I could throw 100 innings, that would be awesome. I've never done that before. So I remember you telling me that before the season started, and I thought you were a psychopath when you mentioned that because at the time we didn't know you were going to be starting. We just had kind of, you know, you'd come out of the pen. But, I mean, you're at 47 innings now at the halfway point. It's possible. You're right there on the cusp of being able to throw 100 innings, which in, what is that, three months? Yeah. Would kind of be a crazy achievement. So that, that, that's a fun one to kind of keep in the back. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll be pulling for that one for sure. Um, what, are, what are some changes in the league? Because we talked about the Campesinos, how they were just absurdly stacked last year. What are some of the changes that you've seen from last year to this year overall in the league? Oh, just the competitiveness from game to game. Mm -hmm. Like last year, the Campesinos were the top dog. They were really talented. They were just a really good squad. Um, And then the Senators struggled last year. I mean, that was just how it went. And then I feel like us and the Mavericks were always kind of head to head, kind of went either way. But it was like, there was like the three tiers of teams. It was like Campesinos at the top, us and the Mavericks in the middle, and then the Senators. And whereas this year, it's it's random weekend to weekend. I mean, it's just going to be whoever executes the better baseball, whoever makes plays clean defensively and controls the baseball better is going to win the game. And I mean, just the competitive aspect is uh, much higher this year in total and not so stacked on one side. Yeah. It, it does seem like defense is playing a big part uh, across the league. I mean, we're seeing games with like 11 total errors yeah. sometimes. And uh, that's how we're kind of getting. I think that's partially why we're getting some blowout scores because offenses in general across the league are pretty explosive. I would say, I would say the Volcanoes have one of the deadlier ones, but, I mean, we're still seeing every other team at any time put up 10, 11, 12 runs. Yeah, it's uh, very common in this league yeah. to have a 10-to-1 game. Yeah, like, exactly. It happens every weekend. Yeah. Um, I guess, too, I wasn't here last year, but I do know that the scheduling is different.
different. So now instead of playing one team or every team each weekend, you guys are doing three game series. Yep. Do you think that has anything to do with how standings are being affected? Or? No, we did that last year towards the second half. Okay. Like the first half of the year, it was everybody played. It was like a round robin tournament every weekend. <laughs> and it turned into essentially you would see the same starter every single time because it was like, oh, this guy's throwing against the Mavericks. This guy's throwing against the Campesinos. And this guy's going to throw against the Senators. Mm-hmm. And so we'd face like the same starter over and over. We'd throw the same starter against teams over and over again. And I mean, it's a small league. People are figuring each other out. Like, it's, there's not many secrets. Yeah. Like, you know what? There's no secrets in pitch repertoire. There's no secrets in velocity. Like, we know who we're facing. And then at that point, I think it's just going to be a lot more competitive with the three game series. And I'm a big fan of it. I think that it, you see the entire pitching rotation, you get to go through the bullpen depth, and you just get a much cleaner look at the squads, I think. Yeah. One thing I disliked about that round robin thing is like, if you worked into a team's bullpen, well, you don't see them again that weekend, so that benefits the other teams. So, oh, you know, yeah. if you're if you're facing the Campesinos and you get deep into their bullpen, yeah. if the Campesinos play the Senators the next day, well, you just helped out the the Senators, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, and playing that three game series format makes it so important to get into the bullpen and jump on the pitchers early, yeah. because then you can get them on short rest later in the series, and it's it's much better this way. It makes yeah. it more competitive, in my opinion, and it's just overall the strategy is better. Yeah. That's a good point. I didn't even really yeah. think, but it's true. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're helping out other teams by right. getting deep into a guy's bullpen early in the weekend what really surprised me this last weekend because we me and lucas were talking about this um when you guys put up 17 runs on the campesinos you hit they had three pitching changes by the third inning right right? and then they threw andrew wilmon in the third which we thought was going to be the guy starting either saturday or sunday all of a sudden he's coming in relief in an 11 to 1 game so it was kind of a head scratcher for us but what we were talking about was you guys had gotten so deep into that bullpen in game one that we thought it was just going to be an absolute blowout for the rest of the weekend. Yeah. But it was kind of the opposite effect. They had guys come in and shove later on. It ended up with a 5-4 to four game uh, on Saturday, and then they ended up winning 7-9-1 or nine to one on Sunday. So it was kind of weird. It just totally went against what we thought was going to happen. I think maybe that's the credit to the campesinos i mean they yeah. had their backs up against the wall so it kind of showed them that they had a little bit of fight in them you know like yeah. starters you have to get you have to eat up innings and they kind of accepted the challenge which yeah. kind of showed them a lot i mean i know they're at the bottom of the standings right now but it, they're still only four and a half back so that could probably something be something that they build off of a little bit oh for sure um yeah i mean you guys got anything else nothing chilling any final thoughts matt um, Go no, canoes. it's going to broken news, and it's <laughs> going to be an exciting second half. Uh, tune in, come to some games, come check it out. It's fun baseball to watch. Yeah. Any Lucas. any player recommendations we should have on the podcast next? Oh yeah. Oh. Who would you? I would get you, Jake Lealios on here. Yeah. You will not regret it. <laughs> okay. Because we were talking to Jacoby Allen, we we're saying yeah. we're going to have him on. We're, oh, we're, Jacoby's funny yeah. too. Yeah, we were Jacoby's planning on having funny. Lealios at some point. You know. Any non-volcano. I haven't gotten to talk to too many guys Mm -hmm. on the other teams. Like, I know them a little bit, but not enough to give, like, person. I don't know their whole personalities and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Well, that was uh, the first edition of the Clubhouse podcast. Uh, Again, my name is Zach Priest. I'm Lucas Anderson. Matt McDonald. And uh, we thank Matt for coming on here as our first guest. And uh, we'll come back to you guys with Episode 2 next week.